Welcome, everybody, uh, and good evening. My name is Michael Tarr. I'm a second-year medical student at New York Medical College, and it's my pleasure to welcome all, you all to the first virtual Grand Rounds by the American Academy of Developmental Medicine and Dentistry. I was very pleased to see how many of you have registered for our first event, and I'd like to thank you all for taking the time and joining us tonight. Uh, in a few minutes, I'll open up a, poll, a few poll questions and just to get a better idea of where our audience is coming from in terms of professional backgrounds, as well as asking why you all decided to join us tonight. At the end of the session, we'll send you a link uh, for a quick survey through SurveyMonkey. Um, it only, should only take about five minutes, but it's important just so, for us so we, uh, so we have a better idea of, once again, what different professional backgrounds you all are coming from, and also to get a better idea of how the session went in your minds. And also, there's a few questions in there that if any of you would ever like to present, we would love to have you. And if you give us your information, you can do it in that survey. So we're especially interested to in find out where you're from because a collaborative effort in, um, and good communication across different fields in healthcare it really allows for better education and improved treatment of our patients. So AADMD virtual grand rounds. The idea was to offer healthcare, um, offer healthcare students and healthcare providers from around the country and people from various different backgrounds a chance to learn more about the diverse population of individuals with developmental and intellectual disabilities. Um, one of the eboard members at AADMD, John Hood, he'll be making a virtual grand rounds library on the AADMD website. Uh, so any of fut the future recordings, and including this recording, will be posted there. It might take a week or so for the first one to be put up just because um, the infrastructure isn't all there yet. In addition to that, we're also looking to become CE certified so that in the future we'll be able to offer credits for participating in our virtual grand rounds. So that's really something we're interested in as well so we can get even more people on here. And finally, I'd like to introduce Dr. Keller, our presenter for tonight. So Dr. Keller is a board-certified neurologist in private practice with Advocare Neurology of South Jersey. He specializes in the evaluation of care of adults with intellectual and developmental disabilities with neurologic complications. He cares for individuals with um, intellectual and developmental disabilities, both in community as well as, as well as in New Jersey's intermediary care facility institution. And Dr. Keller is on the executive board of the ARC at Burlington County, as well as on the board of the ARC of New Jersey Mainstreaming Medical Care Board. He's the past president of American Academy of Developmental Medicine and Dentistry, AADMD, and he's actively involved in national and international health education as a speaker and webinar and workshop participant. Dr. Keller is the co-chair of the National Task Group on Intellectual Disabilities and Dementia Practices. He was raised in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. And Dr. Keller received his bachelor degree from Temple University and earned his medical degree from the George Washington University School of Medicine in 1989. He completed his neurology internship and residency at Bethesda Naval Hospital. He also served as a neurologist at the U.S. Naval Hospital in Okinawa, Japan. Now, before moving on, I'd like to thank Dr. Keller for sharing his time with us and engaging us all with what I'm sure is going to be an excellent start to an exciting new project. Um, hi, everybody. I'm Seth Keller, and Michael, thank you very much for the uh, wonderful introduction. And it's interesting, as I'm going through the names, I can actually see who you are that came on. Um, actually, I know a good number of you, and hello, friends. So I, so a hello to those uh, who know me, and, and I know you, and it's really exciting. And w as Michael was saying, that the um, initial effort of ADMD virtual grand rounds really was a lot of the intention for our um, students in healthcare. But I, I think the cool thing about it, as it turns out, when we put out this notice being open, which is really cool and fantastic, is we have a you know a, a diverse a group of people from uh, families and organizations and, and group home staff, psychologists, psychiatrists, various physicians, therapists, um, and so I, I think it, it's amazing. We had the intention 
was education and training towards healthcare students in some respect, and we had every intention to want to almost have like a a dialogue back and forth. And I think the challenge is that the registration was over like a hundred plus people, so we realized that I don't think we can talk to a hundred people. So. What I'm going to try to do is try to get through the presentation, and then, you know, we we do have the opportunity, perhaps having a microphone open. So I'll try to stop talking and just kind of go on. And as a neurologist who specializes is uh, specializes in adult uh, issues with developmental disabilities. What I wanted to do is, as many cases, is present a case, and I'm actually honored and uh, very happy that uh, our good friend Mary Hogan uh, gave us permission to speak about her brother Bill. And so really the reality of what we're going to be doing tonight and hopefully in our future conversations is, is really not to be esoteric. Uh, to be really grounded in reality and sensitivity about real people and real lives. And so this is exactly my intention for tonight. And I, I, I really think what I want to do is start out with a discussion of how I would be looking at someone who might be coming into my practice, someone being brought in either by family or, or group staff, uh, about Bill. And uh, Bill is a, a gentleman who's living in a group home in New York State. He has Down syndrome, and he's uh, 42 years old. Uh, and the support per people that are bringing him in, uh, whether that's family or staff, are concerned that Bill's not acting right. Uh, he's having their concern about maybe some memory concerns, and they're really looking for for me, and it could be for anyone, a healthcare person or such, who is really looking for advice. What's wrong with Bill, and is what's Bill's difficulties? And I think the one thing from an education educational standpoint is is really what do we need to know ahead of time and this is kind of the questions I have at the bottom is really know uh, who is Bill you know we need to understand Bill and in many cases when Bill comes in um, I'm going to be pretty ignorant about Bill and I'm hopefully that I'm going to have an appreciation of who Bill is and and where has been Bill in his abilities in function and lies before he kind of stepped into my office. And I absolutely do want to understand about the people that support him, uh, where he lives, what's the support network, is there a change, and absolutely the importance of the individuals who are bringing Bill in uh, with him, uh, how well have they known Bill? How well do they really know who he is? And then what changes have occurred and, and to what extent? And as you're seeing by these questions, these are rhetorical open-ended questions and we're gonna talk about that. I absolutely do need to know what's Bill's difficulties, what kind of health conditions has he had, and I brought up just one question uh, from a medical standpoint, you know, has he been on various medications and have they changed, and then certainly what I would want to know is because uh, the individuals bringing it in may not have a lot of medical information from his other practitioners, what has been done? Has there been testing done before I got to see him? And then absolutely, I want to understand the difficulties that Bill is having. But the one thing that is really important, and this will be no shock to people on the phone, is, is to uh, know and want to know is who is Bill. And I think the important thing about it is in many cases, as someone who's seen Bill, I have may, I'll have no clue. I'm going to have a very narrow understanding about Bill, and it's going to be somewhat um, nebulous and esoteric of some generalization about Bill and who he was and where he'd live. And I thought what I'd want to do is really just say Bill was a guy that basically was part of a, a large family in New York State, and, and thank you again to my friend Mary, who really just by visualization of pictures uh, showed me pictures of Bill as Bill was growing up with his family in New York and lived at home to a certain point, was a big part of his family, enjoying life and very active, uh, and in many respects, because of the kind of cool guy he was, uh, there was some reference to him almost like Harrison Ford, the actor at one point, um, so they, that was really the, the, the cool, funny picture uh, as a character to Bill. So, so without this information of photographs or story, I could only in my mind as a practitioner who's trying to uh, get a sense of Bill have a, a very um, very minimal information. So really the point of this slide really in many respects with photographs is really just try to emphasize how valuable uh, it is to really get a full flavor of who Bill was 
uh, during his lifetime because again when I see him in my office I'm going to be somewhat um, focused and centric on really who he is in front of me and I'm only going to be trying to um, get some general sense of who Bill used to be so the best case scenario is the stories and presentations uh, about Bill's life. And Bill, uh, like a lot of people who have had issues, um, had developed a number of medical problems throughout his life, hearing loss, osteoporosis, and as he got older, he had to move at his, for various reasons to a group home, and then sadly, Bill's mom had died unexpectedly in 1997. Uh, just a year after that, Bill had fallen, he broke his hip, and was found that he had some degrees of osteoporosis further, as mentioned, and he had a limp and used a cane. Uh, Bill, uh, unfortunately, he had a number of, of health complications involving his spine and bowel issues and it was around when he was 42 years old around in 2003 when some of the concerns of change or decline were really noticed by folks who knew him quite well and again these are photographs these are you know wonderful great photographs of Bill and his family very engaged in his in his life and he's a real guy I mean he was a real person that really was you know instrumental as like any of us uh, was you know a big part of his family um, so what's been noticed? So here is a number of questions of what ha uh, things have been noticed. And some of these questions and comments are some general questions, are, are things that can, can, can occur. Uh, he can't find his room, he can't remember, his balance is off, and I can go through these, but these are, these are some general questions. He's off in his own world, his behavior might be different, he's sleepy, certainly having seizures is a concern, and then in the kind of life that Bill was involved with, I use the word he doesn't really know how to use the machine, and that's quote unquote, because in his work that he did in terms of uh, uh, in his day job that he was working in, it seemed like he had some problems handling the kind of activities. And these are just general questions, like many questions that are posed, uh, but they have to be fleshed out. Um, and what it is with a lot of these questions is these questions a red flag that has a direct meaning that, oh, you know, if he can't uh, uh, see his room or find his room or his balance is off, does that red flag of a, of a query or statement say that, oh my God, that's dementia or that's some other problem? So a lot of the questions uh, or comments that we see have to be taken about some consideration about how relevant they are that might be strongly tied to some obvious problem problem and the one thing I'll just mention on all these questions is seizures and I'm going to come back to that beginning to have onset of seizures later in life absolutely of amongst many things is certainly a red flag is something dramatic now the one thing that I'll be talking about too is how do we even know that what Bill is going through at this point is even abnormal how do we really know that perhaps as Bill is getting older that maybe these are expectations or changes that might even happen normally for Bill or someone even with Down syndrome? And I say it in that, again, rhetorical way because that's important to appreciate. Because the reality of people with Down syndrome, just looking at this slide, is that just a number of decades ago, people with Down syndrome back even in the 20s, 30s, and through the 60s, really life expectancy for various reasons was very small, sadly enough. And, and as the decades moved on into the 2000s, there's been an exponential rise in the life expectancy for people, not only for Down syndrome, but for ID in general. And so a lot of the age-related changes, normal or not, not, they weren't even appreciated. They weren't even, we didn't even know of what someone who reached a certain age with Down syndrome or other forms of ID, what they would be like. So even understanding about what to expect or be surprised by some of these changes was very different. Now, the diversity of the aging process, and there's, there's Bill who's older now, that's Bill. So he basically, uh, like all of us, you can put your own picture in, perhaps in the center here. What's the diversity of all of our aging process? Each of us, may, whether or not we're a man or a woman, whether or not we're uh, how, our, how we live our lives from a lifestyle standpoint, do we, do we uh, engage in drinking alcohol, do we stay up all night, do we do drugs, do we not take care of ourselves physically or dietary-wise? Uh, there's some susceptibility reasons for each of us, whether it's genetics or from organ systems, um, and really just how we live in our culture or our family. Um, and then how do we compensate? How are different compensatory mechanisms uh, are raised? So there's a huge diversity of the aging process in the general sense that each of us is influenced and affected. 
Now, one thing that's clear is that expected ages is, is happens, and here's a long list, and everyone I'm sure, you know, maybe some of you on the phone might even notice this. This is a laundry list of changes that happen normally as we age, osteoporosis, osteopenia, sarcopenia, which is progressive loss of muscle mass, uh, and I'm going to go through it in just a general sense. We, we lose our hearing, we lose our sense of smell, we lose our balance, we are, and even in cognitive, which is our memory, absolutely normative in a normal way, each of us, I'm 54 years old, each of us at a certain point and over the age of 40, there's absolutely a normal reduction of some of the normal focusing things that we have, short-term memory, attention, retrieval of processing. Normal, 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 normal. So where do we say what's different from you know normal? How do we even differentiate between what's expected and not? So when we practitioners in many respects are seeing an individual in our practice and we're trying to discern is there any abnormalities or is there any pathology, this is a, a diagram that really looks at the concept of what's called functional decline. Functional decline by every respect is just losing function, the ability to, to do what we normally done before and not able to do it as well and the broad categories across in, in the greenish category cognitive sensory, neuromotor, psychiatric, general medical, they're the general broad categories of various things that can go wrong. And in many respects, some of these could be very normal. Under sensory, you know, right now we can start losing hearing or vision or balance. And, and unfortunately, if that happens to us, we have decline in our function. Under cognitive, and I'm going to be focusing on this with Bill, is the cognitive difficulties that happen in seizures, head injury, and strokes. But general medical issues on the far right are often very important, and uh, that's going to be something we're going to talk about too. Um, on the very bottom of general medical, under just above pulmonary, is ADR, which stands for adverse drug reaction, uh, which really is the is the concept that in a lot of medications that we take or individuals with IDD may take, there might be side effects, adverse dry, drug reaction to side effects, and the side effects of a lot of medications might be really relevant in some respect to a primary reason why someone's having difficulties in 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 their function. And that can't be emphasized enough. The challenge in someone with developmental disabilities is that if they're having a side effect for medication, how would they, in some respect, be able to express to any of us that they're feeling bad from a medication? Do, would they be able to, in some respect, say they're lightheaded or their stomach's upset or they're feeling tired or slow? And sometimes by the side effect, their reaction might be behavior the reaction might be something that we might interpret as saying, oh my God, they're having dementia. So there really has to be an appreciation. There's a lot of other reasons rather than being biased that someone with a decline in function is directly related to it's got to be dementia. Absolutely not. There's a lot of reasons. And sometimes maybe there are multiple reasons or multiple reasons why someone might be having difficulties. So what really happened to Bill? Well, Bill was diagnosed with Alzheimer's disease. And, and one difficulty was really establishing a base sign of, of his function. How well could he interact? How well could he think? How well could his memory be? Bill also was having problems of his memory uh, and mood, and he was began on Zoloft. Nemendez, a medication was started, as, well, as I'll talk about somewhat later, was a medication started up a stock because he felt dizzy. Aricept, another medication, was started in, in around April 2008. But unfortunately, Bill uh, got worse. His behavior became more difficult, and it was noted that his thyroid blood levels were markedly elevated despite taking medication, specifically Synthroid, for his um, thyroid dysfunction. So there was a lot of grayness about Bill somewhat because of his thyroid disease. And so what you are even seeing in some of these photographs, the photographs that you're seeing of Bill, in some respect, are reflective of Bill as he was changing honestly through this process. And you're going to see more of that. Cognitive change with aging can be normal, the first part. It can be very normal in the first. Uh, it's more forgetful, slower to learn. But we have the concept of mild cognitive impairment, which might be just immediate recall, word finding. In some respects, it may not be progressive. It might remain that way for some time. However, a good number of people with mild cognitive impairment may then progress and go on to dementia. And I'm going to talk about dementia as we get back to Bill. And dementia is the chronic thinking of problems, and there's two areas which I'll re relate to. 
Delirium, for those that work in the field in healthcare, understand that there could be a change from one sense of thinking to another from one day, from one hour to the next. We would use that, uh, uh, called a delirium, or in, in some respect, an encephalopathy, and that could be from uh, immediate health issues or infections or medication can do that. Falls or head injuries could do that. But also mood dysfunction, such as depression, can also manifest clearly as being reflective of what we might think is as a cognitive problem or dementia, uh, and it can really it could really mimic that. So we have to be very sensitive and careful that any change of function mentally is really not just a sign of, of depression. The diagnosis of dementia is really is a, an acquired syndrome. It's not IDD, intellectual developmental disability, that the person has had their whole life. Dementia is something that is acquired later in life. Uh, and that's really the difference between IDD and dementia. The IDD, they've had dementia, they develop later. And really, in the, in the diagnosis, we, if those practitioners who make the diagnosis are looking for one of the following, which would be language problems, the ability to perform common tasks, the difficulty, uh, uh, ability to recognize common objects, disturbance in, in higher level functioning. So when we make the diagnosis, there's a variable factors that we really look at to kind of figure this out. And dementia is a general term. Dementia, and this is, as you see the umbrella, it's really a, gar, a, a general a term that we use generally, but underneath the umbrella, which is all the other words, Alzheimer's disease, vascular dementia, body, et cetera, and other dementias, is the, the cause of dementia is manifest under many different reasons. There are many different causes of dementia, but in the big box, again, Alzheimer's disease is clearly far and away ultimately the, the largest and most common reason that it that accounts for most people dementia. So in other words, someone could have dementia from say another condition such as uh, other reasons such as alcohol or or problems of infections or in, in or strokes. That could be true, but they don't have Alzheimer's. But if you have Alzheimer's, that is that is the most common reason of dementia, just to uh, understand that. But I'm going to talk about Alzheimer's because we're going to be talking about Bill. Now, Alzheimer's disease pathology uh, really is, is, uh, is where the brain cells themselves that are involved in the areas of memory, um, uh, learning, behavior, executive function begin to uh, degenerate or break down. And that shows you um, on that one cartoon where the the, the brain in someone with Alzheimer's to the far right is, is shrunken and smaller, um, and the brain cells within that part of the brain have kind of degenerated or broken down, and, and in a pathology or slide, there's two main things that we look at, amyloid pack, uh, plaques and neurofibrillary tangles is what we would see in autopsy. And the name Alzheimer's is named after Alois uh, Alzheimer's, who basically coined the term after himself in 1906. Uh, he, he passed away in 1915, so it's really named after him. Um, and then at the top, there's also the shrinkage or atrophy. There's the normal brain. The color, it would be misleading. There's really not much. It should be a difference in color. In some respects, it's really the size difference. The larger size, the fuller brain, the, the lighter color brain, and the darker color brain is really more shrunken down, where it's lost brain tissue. The thing about Alzheimer's disease is that from the very symptoms of the onset early on, uh, is on this particular slide, early diagnosis, is we have a, a expectation of losing function over time. Uh, and this, this, this is something that we know that in people with Alzheimer's disease, whether that's for, with Down syndrome or not, we know that from year to year to year that there's a somewhat of a relative predictability ultimately leading toward the first symptoms, the diagnosis, affecting their independence or their function, behavioral problems, needing some degree of specialized care, whether that's a home or a specialized facility. And unfortunately, it, it is a terminal illness leading ultimately to the complication leading to their death. And, and in this slide, it mentions about like nine years, and I'm going to talk about that in respect to Down syndrome and why do we even mention Down syndrome. Alzheimer's disease and Down syndrome is very important because in it is there's a genetic propensity. Uh, it's that extra chromosome 21 that has the production of beta amyloid, that extra protein that has the buildup that gunks and, and destroys, unfortunately, the brain of people with, of, of Down syndrome, leading to what we see ultimately as Alzheimer's disease. Women seem to have an increased risk. People with Down syndrome who develop uh, their, their symptoms 
often live up to nine years, but unfortunately, there is a rapid decline, which I'll talk about with Bill, in a relatively short amount of time. Sensory impairments, hearing loss, vision uh, can be very common in, P in this situation. And as I mentioned earlier, some of the red flags is seizures, and, and I didn't mention here, but gait dysfunction. So gait dysfunction, walking problems, late onset seizures, they are very manifest as concerns. And as people with, with uh, Down syndrome age, there is a certain predictability over time with statistics of what we might see as they age and it's early onset. By the age of in their 40s, uh, 10 to 15 percent, in their 50s and the 30 percent, and unfortunately by the time they're in their 60s, there's a, a, a pretty large percentage of people with Down syndrome who have already been diagnosed, but you'll see that it's absolutely not it is not 100%, so it's not a definite diagnosis that they have to get. What makes us concerned about uh, how do we make the diagnosis? We have to have suspicion. Uh, I'm going to talk about the early warning screen, the, what's called the EDSD, and I'm going to go through each of these. Now, the early detection screen of dementia, the EDSD, is what we've developed, and, and for those that are on the phone connected with the National Task Group, know this quite well. The, this is a this is a our early warning screen that we recommend for community providers, for agencies as a early warning, as a red flag to fill out for maybe starting at age 40 and someone with Down syndrome and maybe do it once a year. And really what it does, it actually will say, has the individual change from one year to the next in some type of level of functioning in their life? And the form is available um, on our website. It's in, in multiple languages um, and it's informant based. It's actually filled out by the family, direct support, and it's really looking at various issues issues of health status, their behavior, um, and, and some uh, self-reported uh, uh, information. The other part is, is how do we be more definitive about the diagnosis, and this is neurocognitive assessment, and I'm not going to go through all these, but this slide talks about a plethora of psychological tests, paper and pencil tests, administered by a highly uh, trained professional who can sit down in someone with a developmental disability, Down syndrome in particular, and try to pull out or flesh out with questions and answers whether or not they might have dementia. So the EDSD that I showed before is not diagnostic. It's really querying whether or not there's a change, but it's really on the neurocognitive test, which we believe and feel that it has the better chance of maybe trying to prove the diagnosis a little bit better. Um, the one thing that's very important is the term of avoid diagnostic overshadowing in people with IDD and, and uh, uh, questionable dementia. Diagnostic overshadowing is really a bias. It's actually a bias that we may see someone with a developmental disability who's changing and say, oh, their change in behavior or mood or affect or, or function, it's because they, of course they've got developmental disability, of course they've got Down syndrome. So diagnostic overshadowing is like blaming or attributing their change to maybe a normal way that their condition or developmental disability may be, so it may hinder, prevent, or slow the ability to kind of look through that and make the diagnosis. There's a workup, there's testing involved in making the diagnosis. I mentioned the neurocognitive uh, assessment, which I got, again mentioned twice here, um, but the diagnosis in many respects is really empiric, meaning that we're not 100% sure because we don't have, which I'll talk about as a biomarker, so even when we make the diagnosis of dementia, or Alzheimer's disease, do we know 100% sure that that's really purely accurate? In fact, up until more recently, the diagnosis has been really sadly enough based on as someone passes away and if there's a biopsy or autopsy done, that can see some of those pathological changes on the brain. The biomarker, this is the future, so you're going to hear uh, folks in, in the future a lot about biomarkers, and really what a biomarker is, I want you to get a, a sense of biomarkers similar to the way you might think about how do we diagnose, like, say, your blood pressure being high or your cholesterol being high, is you have a black and white test of some sort that can say, oh, yes, you got this, or yes, you got that. There's a whole science right now that's being involved in the future of Alzheimer's disease that really look at these markers, and these are markers that might be on the spinal fluid or in the blood or special MRI imaging. So I could spend all day talking about this, but some of these changes that we notice in Alzheimer's disease actually happen maybe even a decade before it's called presymptomatic, pre meaning that these changes happen in their brain well before they even had the first hint or a change that they even have dementia. 
which makes it very challenging for treating them because it might even be too late. Once they first have symptoms and we're trying to apply medication, it might be even too hard. Now these are two scans right here, or the first one is at the top, it's in the blue. Uh, this is a special uh, type of scan uh, where we're measuring the amount of amyloid, and it might be hard for everyone on the, on, on the call, on the, on the webinar to see it, but, but on the far, um, at, from I'm looking at the far left is the control, it says control. When you see lighter blue or lighter yellow, what that is, that's the accumulation of abnormality, accumulation of amyloid. Amyloid is not a good thing, it's accumulation of protein, um, and in and, and people who are, are normal, whether it's Down syndrome or somebody without a developmental disability who does not have Alzheimer's, you should see a lot of that, that you know, darker blue, but as there's accumulation over time, you begin to see more of that accumulation of, of, the, uh, of the beta amyloid. And as you're going uh, of individuals across the, across the front to the right, you're seeing that accumulation more and more. So this type of per, per picture is something that could be a form of a biomarker as a mentoring of measurement. But having the beta amyloid, does that 100% mean they've got the symptoms and signs of dementia? Well, if you look at the slide below, it has those blue, uh, uh, blue bar graphs, is that what it's really talking about in the study is that as someone with Down syndrome ages from age in their tw uh, 20s to 30s to 40s, is what happens is because the extra chromosome 21, there normally is a huge percentage anyway of beta amyloid in their brain, but there's not the correlation of behavior or dementia. So even though I'm talking about, in one respect, seeing a lot of beta amyloid, and that's highly suspicious for dementia, in people with Down syndrome, they can have a lot of beta amyloid and they may not have it. So we're learning a lot and trying to figure this all out. When I treat dementia, there's a lot of things that we want to do. What do we do? What do we care for? And here's a large laundry list of things that we do uh, as practitioners or other ones of helping people. Quality of life, prolonging life, slow progression, behavior, fall pre for prevention and reduction, hospitalization. And you can see a lot of things that we're going to talk about, signs of abuse and neglect, caregiver concerns, and the medication, which I'm going to have a slide or two. And sadly enough, as the disease takes over palliative care and the life care and certainly the team approach. And I'm going to have a slide that kind of queries about the, qu the question of the future of where this is all going to go for care and practices. I do want to also just mention that is this all inevitable with decline, and here's just one slide that talks about the issues of health promotion, the importance of diet and exercise that may have a huge impact upon stalling or preventing or delaying some of these changes in, in our brain losing function. Uh, I work for Special Olympics, so I'm very proud to talk about that there's a lot of proactive things that perhaps can be done to, to do things, but you know, will, is this done? Is it done in a concerted way? Uh, and is, is there a lot of proof that this will make all the difference? Uh, this is a quick slide, quick, not, it doesn't look quick, but it's just really a slide that's talking about the research on medication for, for Alzheimer's disease and Down syndrome. And there's a lot of, of over case reports that look at specifically of medication, specifically denepazole, which is Aricep. And when you look at the number of studies that have been done over the last decade or so, there's only a, num a small number of, of individuals over time in case reports and research that really look at the usage of these medications the Down syndrome to see if they're actually responding and make a difference. And so it's really unclear whether or not people with Down syndrome get benefit from these medications, specifically denepazole. And on the, bo the, the bottom bullet point, it says NMDA. That's, that's memantine, or um, that's the other one that we use, uh, Nemenda. There really was no improvement in a study that came back in a, in a Lancet Journal article just a few years ago. So right now, when people are treating people with Down syndrome with these medications, there really isn't a lot of, of proof or, or saying that it's even worked. So we have to really question its, its effects. I wish I could talk all day and spend more time talking about behavior because it's huge. Having behavioral issues in people with, with Down syndrome or even with Alzheimer's disease, nearly all people with Alzheimer's disease have behavioral changes. It's very diverse. There's multiple systems involved. Behavioral changes become frequent as the disease progresses and they keep occurring in many cases. Uh, and what we have the term is behavioral and psychological symptoms dementia, which is the definition called symptoms of disturbed perception thought, content, mood, and behavior that happen in people with dementia. So I'll use this, I'll say the acronym 
BPSD, that's kind of an acronym for some of these difficulties, behaviorally wise, especially with dementia, they're complex. They can be really associated with deterioration and they, they can be tied into the physical health. Their, their emotional health, the psychiatric issues are huge and it's very important to tie out or tease out how do some of these behaviors tie into their daily life and their personality. What about their specific environment and social issues that they live in? What's a relevance to their behavior and what's going on in their personal life? And I say it again in this rhetorical way, it's hugely important. So when someone's acting out of sorts in some way, it can't be just taken, well, they're acting out, let's treat them with whatever. You have to say, well, why? Question it. What's going on? What's driving it? And really the concept you might think about is almost like applied behavioral analysis in terms of the setting about what's driving that behavior, what brings it out, what could be looked at to kind of offset the behavior and, and keep it from happening to trigger it. Um, there's a lot of non-pharmacological approaches, and I thought this was very important to talk about in this large number of bullet points. So when people are having behavioral issues, it's absolutely important to talk about non-pharmacologic. And I think what's very challenging is that we as healthcare practitioners, me as a neurologist, I might think that my knee-jerk reaction to treating people is, is pull out my prescription pad. I'm expected to give a drug. I, this is what I do as a physician. I'm not an expert in non-pharmacologic. I wasn't trained in medical school or my residency program. But you know what? I think it's very important for us as practitioners to really appreciate that we have to look at the bigger picture and there's other aspects. Even though we ourselves may not be trained or expert in providing, say, music therapy or, or the lighting or the calmness in the environment or changes in the space, we absolutely do need to realize that when we treat people, we're not, we're not treating people also in a vacuum. There's other people involved in all this. There's Mary with her brother, and at this point, Mary is now comforting her brother Bill, who at this stage of his life, unfortunately, is progressing. Safety, uh, maximizing the structure of his life and consistency, serenity and sanity is hugely important. The four S's about this, and we have to look at that very carefully. What about drugs? Well, definitely when behavior is dangerous, distressing, disturbing, damaging relationships and persistent, it, maybe they've not responded to non-pharmacologic. Uh, maybe we're concerned about emergency issues that are going on and where there's clear indication for maybe symptoms that could be response to medication. We have to think about medication. Um, but unfortunately, we have to really appreciate what the medications do, good or bad. There's a black box warning, FDA black box warning tied to some of the antipsychotic medications so and it increased the risk of stroke or vascular complications. So it's really important to realize that these medications have to be very thought about about using them because of the risk. We have to understand what we're treating, how long we're in a treat, what's the dosage, how do we monitor it, do we do, do we keep them on it, and when do we think we can reduce it or even discontinue it. Here's a slide, and again, this is I could talk all day, and probably it's kind of cutting behavior treatment short. And I apologize. And here's target symptoms and medication, delusion, hallucinations, aggression, agitation, and it goes talks about some of the types of medication we use. So when we practitioners think about medications, we have to tie them to a specific type of behavior. For instance, a you know, if they're having depression or anxiety, some of the medication we use are specifically tied to that or work for that, including mood stabilizers to uh, medications like that. Uh, we have to really appreciate who are we treating and here's a question this is kind of I guess do you need to care uh, quote unquote beyond your patient so here I am in my little black box in my clinic in my office with the four walls around me with the individual with IDD and dementia am I treating them and it's just me I'm treating them or do I really need to think about what about the issues going on with an aging parent or what about the siblings who might be involved in their care? What do I, what do I need to, as a practitioner need to appreciate where they're coming from? What are they going through? Are they having their own issues? Are they, as an aging parent, having their own personal health issues that might be even you know, troublesome to them in their ability to either care for themselves or even their loved one, their, their so-called child? What about their, their friends, or roommates, their spouses? What about the people they may be working with? How does, how does this affect them? And I mentioned this also under the framework, are we delivering person-centered care? 
are we having Bill at the center of focus rather than am I really caring for the other people and I'm not really thinking about Bill and his life? Am I thinking about that? And as, as a physician, am I really putting that all in the context? What about r religious purposes, people in the clergy? What about the organizations? And, and as everyone on the, on the call, and again, when I looked at the number of people on the call and I'm looking about who you are and what you do, I hopefully I'm not leaving you out in terms of who you are. <laughs> because in many respects, everyone on the call knows that they have a pivotal and vital role in some way, shape, or form with the people they care for and support. So therefore, as a physician or a practitioner, are we taking who you are and what you do in consideration? And if not, how can we? How do we take that into consideration? And how do we do that? And it goes, it's both ways. How do the support agencies really look at the practitioners? What about the agencies specifically dealing purposely with aging? How do the organizations that deal with Alzheimer's Association or the AAAs or the community uh, aging organizations that are focused on aging do they come into play? And what about my other colleagues? I'm a neurologist. What about a nurse practitioner? What about a psychologist, a psychiatrist? What about a primary care doctor? How do I communicate with them? Where do they play a role? How do we communicate? How do we go back and forth? And for those that have been around a block long enough, know that in many cases we live in silos. And, and I think this is a sad reality. So in a lot of the picture that I'm talking about, even in the practice and care for Bill, the reality is that we probably sometimes do an awful job. Sometimes we really don't really open up and look at all the big issues. But I think the, the appreciation of IDD, dementia, and certainly Bill in this case, we really do need in a very important way to appreciate it. Who ties it all together? Who's the manager? Who's the crafter of the big picture who can actually put this all together? And I say it in a way because in many respects you don't know. Is it the family? Is it the primary care? Is it a social worker? Um, it, it's a real question. I think these questions are very important to appreciate because I think when there's not a coordination of care, then there can be redundancy. There could be cross purposes in how we care for people, challenging. That there's a real balancing act in what we do. In many respects, in people with IDD for their throughout their lives, from birth on, because they have a developmental disability, they, they basically were trying to fight for their autonomy and for them to have self direction. We're trying to really fight for them to be as as, as uh, independent and and not to be segregated. We want them to have the great value in their lives, but unfortunately, as they're aging and are having these physical difficulties, I'll call it the duty of care. The duty of care is trying to provide services in healthcare or other care practices that basically look out so-called for their best good. We want to medicate them. We want to put them in a safe environment, but will those treatments and those so-called restrictions, if that's the case, what does that do to their autonomy? How do you balance it? And as someone is progressing with dementia, because that's eventually more progressive, it begins a slippery slope where eventually you're taking away a lot of their independence, and it's not an easy situation. It's very gray. It's very gray. Bill got worse. Uh, his, he had more walking problems. He went from falls. He started using a cane to a wheelchair. Uh, and the sad story of Bill, as you can see some of his pictures, that may not look like Bill that you saw in the earlier pictures because it, it sadly enough it may doesn't look like Bill, but that is Bill. It is Bill. He began having problems with behavior and sleep problems and trazodone. And you're going to recognize a lot of the medications. Kepra for seizures switched to lamictal and clonopin. Uh, seizure became worse, agitation, outburst behavior. Uh, the, the organization that was supporting him Unfortunately, because the difficulties of that bill was experiencing, and they as a staff and organization were stretched thin. Where was their training? What was their education? What did they know? Who has been talking to them? Terrible. November 2009, ultimately because of concerns of pain and oxygenation and breathing, he began uh, on, on oxygen therapy. Things got worse. Things do get worse. The cognitive skills decline. The support needs increase. There's risk of falls and injuries, swallowing, breathing, clots, bladder, seizures. Folks, this is a sad situation. Signs of abuse and neglect are very, are very concerning. Where do we look for that? We can't put our head in the sand about this. Who is the one that sees these? Who's the one that looks out for them? All of us do. We really do. The concern about 
the caregiver? How do we look out for signs of caregiver burnout? And if you're concerned about it, what could be doing to mitigate it or reduce it? The decision-making process on ultimately thinking for Bill and advocating for him is end of life. The inevitability, the reality that Bill will pass away is a fact. So therefore, the reality of coming face to face with these decisions and thinking it through absolutely had to be thought out rather than continuing to be on crisis mode all the time and putting out fires. These are things that are inevitable. So it's really better, even though it's a sad reality about talking these, these changes, is to plan, is to think through over time, what are we going to do when it arises? Let's look out for them and let's plan and deal with them in a very proactive way. The National Task Group, which is the organization that, uh, that I'm part of, and I'm just showing up some slides, the good thing is that like we're having on this talk tonight, educate and train. We want to, our young people, like we're having on these, these, these webinars, is we want to learn. We want to educate. We want to greatly appreciate the value of working together in, in a coordinated way. We want to know. And these are, these are um, elements of um, educational material. And there's a whole bunch on the National Task Group website that do have guidelines lines on a community providing supports in the in the community with healthcare providers or direct support. We do have information on training that we can do to come to people's um, location and give them staff training. And I could again spend all day talking about what we do is providing education and training, but I couldn't help <laughs> getting a call out. But the sad reality, the story comes to an ending. Bill passed away three months later. He passed away in 2010, three months after I had last spoken about Bill in terms of his last issue with oxygen. He died. He was 49 years old. So really from the time that he first began having difficulties, it was a rapid decline. The tragedy that happened to Bill, the concern that his family went through watching Bill, uh, the love of their life, the important guy that Bill was, was very sad. And it really was a shock, and there was really a, a need for the family and organizations who were desperate, really desperate to try to get a sense of what's wrong with Bill, give us answers, help us solve this. Is this really dementia? What's going on? And the sad reality that happened throughout Bill's life that does happen to a lot of other people is because of sometimes a lack of education and training and knowledge and sensitivity, a lot of things really tragically happen. And whether or not they could have been done differently and how Bill was cared for or other people is truthful. But what do we learn? What is it that we do? And I think the important thing, and again, you know, the, the bullet points that I have here, what, what could we do different? Absolutely, we're trying to be sensitive and compassionate and, and open-minded. We want to learn and advocate and absolutely thinking team, thinking about this is something that we as practitioners, we can't do it alone. And to think that we're here to solve all the solutions, it's foolish. I mean, it, to me, it's naive and foolish. And think about this as a team approach. How do we work together and be very honest about the realities that we as practitioners, healthcare practitioners in some respect, absolutely do need each other. We need information. We have to listen. We have to consider and communicate. And we want to also don't be judgmental and try to not to be very, very hard about the situation. And also, I'll say I want to be very cynical. You know, when people come in and they, they query us and they give information, do they really know the person? Are they viewing the situation firsthand? Are there other opinions of what's going on? Because in many cases, because Bill and others like himself may not be able to fully speak for himself and what he's experiencing, we do know need a lot of information, so very, so really be cynical in some respects about what we're seeing, otherwise if we're too quick to judge, we might be wrong. We might be wrong about it. So this is really the beginning, and I'm going to stop right here, uh, Michael, and I think what I want to do, and again, I kind of probably went to, went quick, but again, for, the, for our first uh, uh, one what we're doing for these training, we want to be able to uh, you know, put information out there. Are you there, Michael? I'm there. I'm listening. Yeah. So right now, again, I'm going to stop right here. Um, and I don't know, Michael, I mean, it's right now 924. Boy, I'm, I'm actually impressed. I, I probably talk like a maniac. And again, I, I'm going to, I really appreciate the opportunity to present in our, our first webinar. Um, but I absolutely do hope that those that were on tonight, and I'm sure that, that those that were on who are in the field, obviously you're on because you care enough to be involved in wanting to listen. I'm sure a lot of you get exactly what I'm talking about. And 
and each of you uh, who are involved in the care and practices um, are interested in what's going on. And Michael, I'll just kind of ask you a question. As a second-year right. medical student, what have uh -huh. you heard or what have you learned about aging and IDD or Down syndrome and dementia? I mean, what, is, what have you learned, you know, through your school at NY uh, you know, Medical College? Right now, I mean, it's 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 a little bit limited. But we've most of what we've learned has been from textbooks, and you know, it's kind of your classic presentation. Um, and I think what what we've learned from your presentation is that you don't really get to know a lot about a, a disease and how it presents um, until you have a patient to put it with, um, to put to it, and you learn more about how it progresses and how it affects a patient's life, how it affects their family. Um, I think I've learned more about this through experiences with my sister and with um, individuals in the ID community and really seeing how it affects once again them and their families um, and then obviously learning about it from a medical standpoint you kind of get a better idea of um, what to expect and, and what the possible changes are in these patients uh, so I think it gives you, you kind of need both aspects to have a better understanding of these patients and and how to better treat them Absolutely. Now, my, my, can you also maybe give a, per, a perspective before we finish? I know you have an exit poll. The perspective of these, uh, again, these virtual, you know, discussions about the role, responsibility of our goal of student training and maybe, you know, having other people come on. I mean, what's your, like, where do we go from here from what you hear or view for, like, maybe the next one? And what's the thought about this? Because this is obviously IDD dementia. But right. which, what have you heard or what have you, um, you know, talked about with our other colleagues? I uh, mean, in terms of the virtual grand rounds? Yeah, in the, the future. Right, in the future. Right. right. Well, so basically what our goal is to try to get um, speakers from various different backgrounds and with different experiences to share their experiences with their patients, uh, um, specifically in cases like you did today and tonight. Um, and so we get a better idea of how different clinicians, how different uh, areas of medicine approach treatment of this diverse population of patients so we can work towards a better collaborative treatment method and also uh, be better educated about um, the different aspects of our patients life so we know what's actually happening we have a better understanding of what's happening when our patients go to the physical therapist or when when they go to the speech language pathologist we're really getting the insiders look because when uh, I mean I'm uh, speaking kind of hypothetically because I don't have the experience of a clinician, but I assume that when um, you refer a patient out, you, you don't, I mean, you're not in the room with them. You don't know have you don't have that um, experience of what's going on in the other professional's offices. Um, and so I really think it's a platform for us to educate each other. Uh, and it's convenient because it's online, so you can just log in and, right. and you can experience it. In the country. Michael, I'm going to make a suggestion, and again, you know, again, I, I don't want to take up the auction in the room. I know we, I wish I could ask other people. We, unfortunately, because of the timing, but I think what might be valuable for these presentation is to have maybe like almost like an IHP, like maybe have, you know, people when we present is having a few different people that are in and around the situation. Maybe you know a support right. staff, a family member, a practitioner, or etc. And I think it does give us more of a holistic approach to care. For me, as a physician neurologist, I'm trying to give a more well-rounded conversation to try to be sensitive to what I view, what others may look at. But I do think because we do believe in the ADMD that we do hope and believe that we do care and treat and and practice this way. That I think in our future, uh, these webinars, virtual webinars. I think maybe, you know, if we believe that's how we should care for people, then we should probably present having that presentation in that way. The challenge would be, you know, doing it in an hour or such. But I, I think that's something that we're going to learn from in the future, but we'll have more conversation. And I definitely agree that the post questions that you put out there is is really huge is to learn how do we improve and what can we do further as you as you mentioned earlier, Michael. Right. Well, I like that. I like that suggestion, especially to hear from from family members, because oftentimes you you can't read about that. You have to you have to learn from your patients and their families. 
why not? <laughs> why why should we not be hearing from our consumers? I mean, how foolish is that? If it just you know, I mean, you got here and I, you and Michael, we could we could talk all day. We have all these other people listening, but really, it's kind of it's naive and foolish. Why would we not have someone that's there dealing with it and who has that honest, clear perspective? I mean, I might say things about, oh yeah, do this and do that, and this is what I want you to do as a doctor, and I tell them it might be so stupid. I mean, they might look at me and say, what are you talking about? We can't do that. This this is not how we can care. We can't, you know, we can't follow this you know, this regimen, and it's just not realistic based on what we do in our, you know, home or our organization. So we really do need to understand. And I think the beauty of working in developmental disability healthcare is because of the nuances and depth and complexity of of of. Uh, you know, IDD and and the just like you, Michael, you understand about yourself because of your sister, right? Right, right. And you so understand. everybody who's listening, they should. <laughs> yeah. And um, everybody who's listening, if they also, I, I imagine they have their own opinion or, or um, maybe they have different ideas, they should absolutely go to the survey that I linked in the chat box um, and fill it out. Like I said before, it should only take about five minutes, but there's spots at the end, there's questions at the end for you to put in your own input um, about where you think uh, this Virtual grand, where you think virtual grand rounds fits in in AADMD, and what you think um, would be a good move for it, where you think we should move or go with it. Uh, being that it's now 9:30, I mean it's right at the end. I, I, I just want to last say is that I, again I wanted to thank my my good friend Mary Hogan um, and you know at her respect for Bill Hogan. Um, you know God bless you know Bill. But this is also you know to many other individuals you know like Bill who who've gone through the passage and phases of his life uh, through health and sadly enough through the decline and eventual death. But this is a real honest um, uh, situation and. Also, you know, Michael, when we do this, I, you know, this has got to be dealing with the reality to hit hard home that we're talking about, you know, real people, real people that are have had lies and and they are definitely affected about what we're talking about, and we have to be, you know, make it as humanistic and realistic so it makes us really uh, well grounded and sincere, right, Michael? And this is kind of what we you right. know, got to remember. That's a part of medicine. It's there. It's you personal. go. We do the best we can, right, my friend? Well, That's thank right. you very much. I appreciate it. So I'm kind of done, unless there's anything else. It being that it's oh, we just got through an hour, I was pretty good. We got, we were able to do it. So anything well, we, else, Michael? Did you want to uh, close shop or? Uh... And I guess no, what I they just could do, to Michael, thank you and thank everybody for joining. Yeah, and I guess Michael, if I guess if people do have questions, they can email. I don't know if you have an email address, they can actually ask us questions offline, and we can email them back or communicate with other people. So I don't want to shortchange people if they want to ask me or ask you or ask others A, D, and D people uh, uh, contact information. Do you have that? I do. I can actually just put my email in the chat box so they have access to it. And, th and you can forward things on if there's any questions for me. Sure thing. Sure thing. And also. Um, I'm not sure if your email is on the flyer that they were all sent um, with the link to sign up for this, but I know mine is at the bottom as well if they don't get it from the, um, the chat box. I just put it there. Seth Keller okay. at AOL.com. I'm not hiding from nobody. <laughs> Seth Keller. <laughs> anyway. All right. And there is mine. Thank you very much. Thank you. All right. I think that it does it. So thank you, everybody. I'm going to stop the recording now. Okay, good night, everybody. Thank you very much. It's been an honor. Thank you again. Appreciate it. Thank you, too. All right, Take Michael, care. thank you, too. Have a good night, though. All right, bye-bye.